and I realized my unforgiveness, my anger toward my mom and dad was really just a fear of my own failure. My fear that I wouldn't be able to hold whatever promises or things like that I'd held in. Hi, and welcome to the Storia Podcast. I'm David Neronia. And I'm Fabiano Altamora. And this is where storytellers disrupt. Today we have the absolute amazing honor of having Dr. Amy Lee Wicks in the studio with us. This is kind of like a short bio of Dr. Amy Lee Wicks. Amy Lee Wicks is the author of The Dangerous Country of Love and Marriage from the Auckland University Press, and her work has appeared in print and online around the globe. She holds a PhD from Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand and an MFA from the New School in New York City. Amy Lee lives in Northern California with her husband, Matt, and is acting head of drama department at Bethel Conservatory of the Arts. Dr. Amy Lee Wicks, thank you for coming on. Thanks so much for having me. She's our first doctor. mm, Second. Second doctor? Who was the first? Jake. Oh, all right. There he is. Jake Glover. Jake Glover was like, well, peace out, Jake. You are a second, but you're the first full-time doctor that we've had on staff. Is Jake only a part-time doctor? He, <laughs> no, he's part-time member of staff. Oh, okay. He's not a part-time doctor. Okay. You are, you're the first um, doctor we have had on staff full-time. And it's, uh, it's, it's awesome to have you. Amy is taking over my role at the Conservatory of the Arts as head of acting. And she has been amazing so far. But Amy, we want to hear about you. We want to be here, but hear about your journey up to this point and your artistic journey. You know, I know you 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 trained in acting and you trained in performance theater. So give us a little bit about your background and how you got into the arts. Great. Um, I think I was born into the arts. <laughs> I was playing dress up from the time I was little, and I remember finding a box of my grandmother's poems. Uh, I would have been about seven in the attic of hers in my grandfather's home and just hiding away in the attic. It was it was a box full of her handwritten poems. I actually couldn't read her handwriting that well, but I imagined what, I filled in the blanks with my own words. Um, and I also found a box of photographs in her attic, hmm. pictures of my great grandmother hmm. who was uh, Loretta Lee. She was a burlesque dancer. It's a good name, Loretta it's, Lee. It's really Specifically, maybe for a burlesque dancer, it sounds like <laughs> just a great stage name. Yeah, and I just wow. I remember looking at the fantastic great grandmother who, um, when I was very little before she passed away, she would wear her fur coats and drink her boxed wine mm. on her porch and just just a very interesting box wine. Mm. I, this lady, she's already my favorite. She's just fantastic. <laughs> That's pretty great. You know, I've got a six year old little daughter at home named Talita and we had family over and I watched her literally do wardrobe change after wardrobe change. It just feels like it's like in the inner design of kids to, yes. to play dress up. Did you always know or sense or feel, even if you didn't have the language for it, that you were creative and how did it express itself for you? It's a great question. I think it was, it was compulsive for me to want to play and to make things and to imagine. Um, I know, I know not all kids have the, the capacity or a safe enough space to be able to play and imagine in. But for me, my room, my dolls, my mom's old dresses, um, my grandmother's junk jewelry, those were my like treasures. And as soon as I learned to read and write, I found myself wanting to create on paper. And then kind of the synthesis of understanding, wait a second, I can wear a costume and go play kickball, and then I can come in and make a play, and then I can make my brothers and sisters, who wouldn't actually be cooperative at all, um, perform in these things that I was putting together. I just, just the idea that your whole world could be filled with creation. You could move your peas that you didn't want to eat on the plate and make something pretty. and. Mm. You know, you, it could be what you eat. And, and when you're watching movies, you can try the voices. And so I mean, I, your parents must have fostered kind of a very creative atmosphere, though, right? Because, I mean, you know, a lot of the time it kind of gets shut down after mm. a certain age. You know, it's all right. Play with your dolls and everything. And just as a side note, I thought you were going to say Talita was playing with a box of wine. <laughs> no. And by the way, are you still playing with your dolls? Because we've talked about that. <laughs> just occasionally. Well, you know, but like it's great that they kept that atmosphere of creativity or was it something that you they didn't and you just did it anyway I think I appreciate more my parents 
mm, way of of raising us. We were all really different. I don't I don't think either mom and dad were like, we hope we get an artist in a child. <laughs> I don't, think, I, yeah, just, I, don't <laughs> I don't know too many parents really. I don't, yeah. I don't know that that was yeah. in their in their dream scope. Yeah. But I will say, um, my mom particularly when she was home, she would bring out her fine china, and I could have tea with my stuffed animals and that was Mm -hmm. something that she made space for and when I had field trips she would field trips or or creative projects for school we would go over the top if there was a day you know spirit week at school for kids Uh yeah oh yeah I had many a blacked out tooth and rollers in my hair and strange costumes that far exceeded what children would show up kids would show up in their pajamas and I'd be like mom I want to be like I want to be like a hillbilly from this time in this particular town. And my mom would be like, all right, let's go. So I think they did foster it. Um, and then dad was delighted in me. So that <laughs> that, that was enough encouragement. So it sounds like from an early age, you, yeah. you, you had a sense that, or, or not a, if not a sense, you, and I love your word, compulsion to write, to direct, to act, to imagine. And I love, by the way, kickball is somewhere in there because it's maybe, <laughs> maybe the most underserved American sport. I mean, it was certainly one of my, that and bat ball, which by the way is the same ball, but with a bat, which is a total hazard because that, that bat was always <laughs> bouncing off that big ball. All right. So flash us forward. So h- how does this play out into high school and, and college, this sense of play and creativity? Great. I found Shakespeare, Shakespeare and company found me in my sophomore year of high school I love it. Kickball to Shakespeare. Shakespeare. That's yeah, yeah of course. It was, it's the natural progression of things. Kickball is not like pickleball. Kickball is like a big. No, it's good. It's I, good. I love my British friends. So it's like a big bouncy ball, yeah. and you just kick it with your foot, and then it's kind of no, because then it, you combine it with like a baseball it field. So it's basically baseball without the bat, and then you just use your feet and you kick the ball, and then you run the base. It's just oh, like, you Americans! <laughs> wow, says the man okay. who invented it's a cricket. Game. Okay, right, well, so that's you, true. <laughs> who nobody understands. Um, <laughs> I agree with that. Um, uh, okay, so um, you somehow uh, discover Shakespeare. Tell me about because I, I had a similar. I think we all probably were touched by Shakespeare. But how? What was your first impression of Shakespeare? What was your first contact with the Bard? It would have been, it would have been sophomore year. I don't know. I was. It was the first time Shakespeare and Company from Lenox, Massachusetts, wow. came to our particular high school, and it was actually my first year in the high school. I had transferred schools a lot as a child, and these professional actors from Shakespeare and Company were tasked with going into local high schools, casting full productions with high school students and then spending the next three months working with them and producing wow. shows that they would then bring to Lenox, Massachusetts for a weekend-long Shakespeare Festival. So everything, the audition process was actually all games-based. Hmm. You showed up and you were given lines that obviously you didn't understand, and you had to run across the room, get to another person, and deliver to them. And you, your job was to say yes, whatever happened in, in these right. games. And their entire casting process was based on on watching us play together. That's mm. how they cast their shows. So. Man, I think we need to rethink how we audition at BCA. <laughs> BCA yeah, yeah. That sounds like a lot more fun than what we're it doing. Was it does. So fun. <laughs> and, and it was beautiful because I remember the directors were very open about, hmm. we are actors, but we're happy to work with you, but but this isn't our bread and butter. We're, we're taking a risk as well. They were very vulnerable. And preparing for it, spending hours doing line work as a 14-year-old, mm-hmm. um, I fell in love. I didn't want to leave. Mm. We were we finished school at three, and I was in the theater until about eight o'clock every night. and And I just I just loved it. I loved the community it created, and I loved being coached. So we, from the time we did line work, we were never allowed to have our scripts with us. You mm. stood on the stage, and the director stood behind us, and they fed you your lines, mm. and they would feed it to you, and you would try different things out. Um, they also used different methods, um, some of which probably led me into habits that I had to break later on, <laughs> emotion memory being one of them, but very effective if you're a director mm. trying to... Um, emotion memory in Shakespeare? Yeah. Interesting. Absolutely. Americans, again, <laughs> you do so <laughs> many British, things we've interestingly. We've offended them somehow. <laughs> no, 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 no. Let no. me ask you a question, man. What was, what was your... Because this is always a beautiful experience for me. Yeah. Like it's like falling in love for the first time. Talk to me about your first experience with Shakespeare. Uh, it was not a great experience because, oh. it, well, it was all right. It was my, the first monologue I ever got. Oh. 
was a Shakespeare monarch. Wow. I think it was Puck. How old were you? Like 13. Jeez. So it was when I first watched Big and wanted to become an actor. My dad was like, well, you know, go into the Yellow Pages and find a drama teacher. Oh, gosh. Yeah. So and then you used the Puck thing. I used the Puck, well, not to get into drama school because I was only 13. But No, no, but to, to the acting class. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what that's Did you what just pick it me. up? Oh, that's what she, she gave She gave me. me that Puck. So and then... I would do like Romeo and Juliet in school. And like, you know, I say to our students, so Shakespeare, like the Bible in effect, is not just meant to be heard. Mm -hmm. It's meant to be played. Yeah. You know, the Bible's you come, you get faith by hearing the word of God. It's active. Um, but it really, to be completely honest, I, I did, I did a, a play with, with James McAvoy, I did Romeo and Juliet with him. And um, even though I loved that at the time, mm. I lost my love for it until I met with Dan, uh, Diane Venora again. Mm -hmm. actress from heat who studied at Juilliard. Juilliard unbelievable. A... And she said to me, I said, listen, you know what? I've loved Shakespeare, but I find he's becoming ir irrelevant or not necessary. You said that in Diane. film stupidly. <laughs> well, it's just a stupid phrase anyway. So anyway, I said that to her and she went, you know what? You're trying to bring Romeo down to your level mm. and you weren't tried and tested. You've got to elevate yourself to Romeo's level because mm. he stood the test of time. And that just kicked my butt. And ever since then, I've gone back into a love affair with Shakespeare. You know? So my first blush with the Bard was as a gangly middle schooler weight training with a guy named Danny Fickle. <laughs> this is so great. This is, not, this is not made up. <laughs> and it's the 80s. So he has a boom box and we're listening to like probably the Beastie Boys which is also oh, a perfect segue gosh. into Shakespeare. And he comes in, Danny was such a fascinating kid, but he, he really changed the course of my life. So he comes in with like a 125 year old copy of Hamlet. Oh my gosh. Wow. Belonged to his grandfather, wow. his great grandfather, something like this. And he brings it in. And it was so weird. Like this is where, you know, God's around because like why yeah. on earth would Danny bring this in while we're like, trying to get pecs to, you know, you know, meet cute girls. So he comes in with a boombox, whatever. And then into the cassette player, he puts a recording of Richard Burton. Oh, doing Richard, doing Hamlet? Doing Hamlet. Oh, wow. Which there's actually a, a, a filmed recording of. And, and I describe it like this. I had no idea what he was saying, but as a Cuban kid from the barrio, I felt what I heard Fam Hamlet feeling in his voice. And I was like, how can this prince dude from another time in a country that I've never visited remind me of how I feel on the inside, the pain he was feeling at the loss of his father? Not that I'd lost my father, but that pain in his voice. And it was in that moment that, man, that I fell in love with Shakespeare. I didn't know it, but it really was the first touch I had with acting. So you have, you, Amy, you have this experience with Shakespeare and, Com right? and company. Talk to me about how that sets your trajectory. Does it lead you to college to want to study acting? Where does that take you? So I, I wish I could say that from Shakespeare and Company, I, I went on and stuck with it. And But the truth is I, I, did, I, I did my sophomore year and my junior year, and mm. then they didn't come to my high school again, which oh. was devastating oh. for me. Yeah, And then I did school plays, which sort of, I hate to say it, but it, it, it felt like it chipped away mm. at my, I, w I just wasn't as enthralled. Mm. I remember being in the middle of a performance for the stage, stage door. And in the middle of my performance thinking, is this it? I just, and I was in high school still, but thinking, here I am saying my lines and everyone's looking at me. I feel like there was more than this. Last well, I, think, I mean, did it have anything to do, you think, with like, having this kind of pinnacle climactic mm. first impression and encounter it's almost like i don't know you know i mean did, did, did it feel like a letdown from your original experience i, I think it did and i yeah. think it also i i didn't necessarily know it at the time but the the quality of story and my being able to get lost in the story was so mm. different because what I loved about Shakespeare was I forgot everything else mm. when I was in the theater. When I was doing my line work, when I, whether I was performing or playing, um, when I realized I could fall in love with someone on stage that I would never fall in love with off stage, but but that it, it, there could be moments of real imagination, mm -hmm. real truthful actions happening, um, and to move from that 
into a kind of mimicry, I guess, huh. because that was what was needed to get the show produced. Mm. So I went on to college and... Where are you now when you're in college? Where? So I was between NYU's School of Social Work with a split major in... I was going to do theater and I was going to do social work. And I had met their, yeah. their guidance counselor had driven up from Manhattan to upstate New York to meet with me and had a very promising scholarship waiting for me. And, and I turned it down. Um, mm. And I, I, I think that my path was being guided um, by something much bigger than me. But at the time I was also in like not the best high school relationship ever. <laughs> I ended up staying a year and doing community college. I did two years of study in, in one year. I started in high school. And I also turned down an almost full scholarship to the King's College where I ended up going mm. later. Um, and while I was in community college, I took every acting class and honors acting class I could. And I loved it, but it felt very piecemeal to me. It felt like I was having moments mm. of joy and clarity and then I would go to my English class and I would have moments of getting lost in a story and then get sucked out but I didn't have a frame or a narrative over my life or a real mm. sense of this is the way that I must go and so when I went to the King's College which is well, at the time it was in the Empire State Building now I think it's on Wall Street their campus has, has moved Wow, they had a college inside the Empire State yes it That's was so like cool. the men in black of schools it was awesome there was a really <laughs> small student body we had to swipe to get in to the Empire State Building and um, one I have to tell you this story yeah. okay there was one point in, during my first year where a man had attempted to tight rope walk across the from the from the empire state building to a building across the way oh he had repelled he had he had done things he wasn't supposed to do and so when you would walk through the metal detector there was i kid you not like a a printer from a normal computer printer printout of a man attempt <laughs> like a wanted po poster yeah it was just like him and his climbing equipment attempting to oh. climb and it was like do not let this man in. And there was no way of identifying the man from the picture. But every time you walk in, you're like, are they going to say Probably I'm because in? it was like an oh, inkjet printer in. from, yes. yeah, yeah, yes. from so Office you, Max. You thought they were going to think you were him? <laughs> I had hoped. I, I was, was going to say. <laughs> um, but at the King's College, I went thinking I was studying education because I thought, okay, right, I will become a teacher and I will do all of my creative things on the side, but my career will be teaching English and then I will be an actress and then um, I will also travel the world and live in a camper van. And uh, those those were the generals of, of it all. And I would open a couple of orphanages along the way. I, did, I didn't know where necessarily. Um, but the, the education major had been taken away sometime between my acceptance and their opening of orientation and so I was put into a politics philosophy and economics major and I was like oh, I, I don't know what any of those they things actually are. just put you in that oh yeah yeah doesn't this make you feel better about the early days of Bethel Conservatory <laughs> it does that's ridiculous <laughs> though. but and and I oh remember my. the first day being like oh no because I've this I but I'm here mm. now but my parents but I remember you sat me. down with someone from the school and I remember because you've told me what they said to you which is really impacted mm. me as well what did they say to you after putting you in a major that you hadn't signed up for, they, they said something to you that was pivotal. There was, um, Peter Wood was the provost at the school at that time. And mm -hmm. he, he encouraged us that whatever you wanted to study beyond Kings, whether it was, whether you wanted to be a lawyer or a doctor or a teacher or an artist, I don't know if artist was included, but it was for me. Um, he said, we will teach you how to read, write and think critically. Mm -hmm. And if you can do that, you'll be an asset wherever you go. And they also, it, it was, it also felt like men in black in that we got there for orientation. And instead of like, yeah, we made it. They were like, you all did really well until now. But if any of you think you'll get above a C, you're wrong. And we were like, what? This is, oh, this it's is like fame, like the opening of fame, but oh, for, yeah, yeah. but for nerds, right? For writers. It was amazing though. It, it, <laughs> this is where it's, yeah. this is where you pay, whatever it is. That it, like. I spent the next three years learning really to think critically about hmm. everything about my faith, about how the world worked, why I believed it worked, which which turns out underpins 
all of story, right? Mm. Every story, Robert McKee says, is one controlling idea mm-hmm. wrapped in an emotional spell. You just said Robert McKee. <laughs> Come on now. Don't do that to me. Um, for, th- for those that, that are listening, maybe younger folks who haven't gotten a PhD, when you use the word critically in the context that you are, it's a little bit differently than it's used out on the street. When we say thinking critically, we're not, mm. you don't mean judgmentally. What does that mean? I think I'm using the word critical more in line with the medical term of like something that is urgent that requires mm. full attention mm. and care before a decision can be made. So when I when I'm thinking critically, I'm I'm not just thinking about how the world seems to be working or how everyone is telling me it's working, but I'm wondering what might be the root causes of why things are happening and and how can I um, how can I engage with ideas and not necessarily either make a judgment or jump on a bandwagon before I've had time to to look at the facts and to not just the facts, but look at the ideas that have gotten certain movements to where they are, mm-hmm. things like yeah. that. I think the good thing about that as well, it's like when you, when you learn to think critically, you don't ever judge your character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, break you that down I mean? for people who don't know what that concept means really to not good. judge your character. What does that mean, man? This is going to be could be could sound kind of controversial in some areas but you know for example if you're playing the villain when the villain is living out his calling whether right or wrong moralistically to them it's a cause it's a crusade it's a you know for example i'm using the term hitler here right because he's one of the most renowned villains on the planet but he believed what he was doing was justified so if I play that character, I have to play it from his shoes as being justified. Now, Fabiano, the actor, horrendous, would judge him. But if I get to play him, mm-hmm. I can't play him from a point of judgment or that I wouldn't bring truth to the role. Yeah, because judgment cuts you off from the ability to play it does, truthfully yeah. and honestly. Yeah. So yeah, you're not coming into moral agreement with the thing. No, no, of course not. Yeah, yeah you're just trying to inhabit him from the inside out. So I'm yeah. curious. So you have this exchange at King's. Push me forward to where you go next geographically, which is pretty cool. I mean, there's some hobbits hanging uh, yes. where you hang out next. So I finished the King's College. I went on to the new school. I finished the new school, which is also in Manhattan. And my supervisor, David Lehman. So that's undergrad master's. Yes. Yeah, so my yeah. master's, sorry, my master of fine arts at yeah. the new school. Um, I had the absolute privilege of being under David Lehman, who's the editor of the Best American Poetry Series. Um, just really cool dude and he finished reading my thesis and said you've got to go to New Zealand and find out what this is all about now this is strange my my inclination toward New Zealand in the first place was was two things a conversation with a man I was dating who would later marry so good inclination well done sense. he had been to New Zealand and when I said can you describe it to me he said you'd have to go and I took that as a loose invitation <laughs> I don't know that it was but I took it the same way I I've taken other um, signs and wonders in my life to mean things that are large and beautiful. And so I, the, the other thing was my parents let me know they were getting a divorce, oh. which devastated me. And I was not drinking alcohol. And so I went to the library, which was sort of my substitute, and was studying for my, my thesis. I had to do a a thesis I had decided to do the history of New Zealand as told by an American poet having never been there and the first poet I came across was a man named James K. Baxter who was kind of a a dichotomy he was a dichotomy in a lot of ways he was an alcoholic who found freedom doing AA converted to Catholicism secretly without telling his wife, who was an Anglican, so she kicked him out. The story oh. is much more complex. Than I that. love that it wasn't the alcohol that, no, it that sent him running. It was, yes. it was if he could convert to Catholicism without telling me what else, what else don't I know? Fair enough. And one of the things that he said was, nothing draws down the mercy of God like moral failure. Mm. And it really, mm. it hurt me. It made me angry because I thought, I don't, no, I, I don't like that. I want to get my life in order, and I want everyone around me to get their life in order. And But he wrote a poem to his ex-wife when they were separated, and it was called He Waiate Motekare, which is a love song to my beloved. And in it, there was a passage about how 
marriages had fallen apart, but if she could find her way to where he was, they might be happy. And I took it as a sign that if I could study him, I would find out how to force my parents to remarry each other, which wow. which never happened. But it did get me a PhD, and it also led me to radical forgiveness of first my parents and second everyone else who had who had not been able with their human will to be able to hold what they felt were the calls in their life. And I realized my unforgiveness, my anger toward my mom and dad was really just a fear of my own failure, my fear that I wouldn't be able to hold Mm. whatever promises or things like that I'd held. And, and the forgiveness led way to probably the the deepest, most beautiful relationship I've ever encountered with my mom and dad. And, um, and also, I was finally able to appreciate, I think, the man, the character of James Baxter, because I wasn't either putting him on a pedestal as someone who had answers or villainizing him. I wasn't, I wasn't judging either his actions or his story. And, and so, so off I went to New Zealand. Um, my husband and I eloped, and we rode motorcycles to here. And then we launched from here, sold our motorcycles for plane tickets, and spent a few years in New Zealand. Um, And you did your doctorate in creative writing? Yes, with a focus in poetry, and James K. Baxter ended up being a real focal point in my PhD. And this came out of... um, How did you... Well, I mean, funny you say that, (laughs) Dr. Amy Lee Wicks. Um, This came out of your, after your degree, right? You published this after your PhD. Many of those poems were written as part of the creative aspect of my dissertation. That's amazing. I don't know if there's a central theme because I'm assuming it's a collection of, 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 of poems. Yeah. But oftentimes in an artist's work, mm. uh, at least for if there's a season that they're in or they're exploring, that was during the time that you were in New Zealand? That's correct. Yeah. Is, was there an itch you were trying to scratch? Was there, if somebody were doing their dissertation on you, would they would they find a, a theme or a central idea or something that you were exploring during that season? So the central theme of my dissertation was that the most valid type of creation, at least in in particular, the focus was poetry, but, but really this was something that I have probably been scratching at since I was seven before I had, before I understood what, it, what the summum bonum or the good life was. Mm. But it was this idea of what what does it look like um, to create authentically, mm. uh, truthfully. And I have been a very spiritual creature since I was a small child. And I have also been a very messy girl since I was little. And so the title of my thesis was Confessional Transcendence, a Contemporary Mode of Poetic Creation. And it was the idea that mm in order to live and exist as a creative and be relevant, what was necessary isn't necessarily just the rebellion of the confessional poets in this case, particularly the, the confessional movement of the 50s and 60s, which did have merit and was new, um, but at this point has become fairly predictable. Hmm. And it also wasn't just the transcendentalist movement of the 1820s to 1850s, which dealt with the idea that you were so heavenly or otherworldly focus that you could forget about where you were that all you needed was to be alone away from people mm. away from books just mm. under the night sky and I um, I used James Baxter as an illustration of someone who in his own words described himself as stretched on the rack of the middle world hmm. which is where I feel um, we're called to be both keenly aware that there is more that we live in different realms and also um, rooted and established and unafraid of the darkest parts of the characters we right. might play and even um, the darkest places we may have gone or may have come to. I, I love contrast. I love mm, yep. coloration and shadow. And I love I love the idea that um, I guess my controlling idea as a creative is that of Julian of Norwich. In the end, all will be well. And if all is not well, it is not the end. Um, and in the meantime, the colors and shadows and things that that shape us and wound us ultimately can also bind us and lead us mm. 
to where we're meant to go, which is in the bosom of the Father. Absolutely. That is the very um, That's cool. poetic. I can geek out about this stuff. I, like Dave, you said so. Baxter said the thing about stretched. He did. It reminds me a lot about, about what Bill says in mm. terms of we owe the world an encounter, and it's yeah. about bringing heaven mm. to earth. And, and as you were sharing about being stretched between these two places, yeah. even the implication that we're citizens of two kingdoms, or, you know, both of heaven and, and here on earth, uh, that we're citizens here and there. Um, I, I just I saw a connection in that place yeah. of being stretched. And I like what you said as well about, it reminds me saying when you, when you found out your parents were getting divorced, that element of having to forgive. I think if we live in a, uh, there's two parts of this, if we, if we live in unforgiveness, it, it stops us from accessing those deep parts of our creative self that we truly want to express, right? I mean, we can express through pain, but I think if we live in that place of judgment and unforgiveness, we will always create from a point of judgment and unforgiveness. Um, but as you lent into that unforgiveness, and I like what you were saying about, um, you know, exploring, not for indulgence sake, the dark side of humanity, but the the real side of a fallen, you know, we are fallen humans. We are new creations, I get that, but you weren't afraid to explore both sides of that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I feel like that's the coolest thing about Jesus is that he's unafraid. There's nothing, uh, he's such an, there's there's nothing he's afraid of. There's no no place he won't go. There's mm-hmm. no no valley too low. Yeah. So we don't, why, why do, maybe this is for another time though, isn't it, I guess. <laughs> We, well, no, I think it's for another time. Cause I want to, yeah, I want to get okay. into this because it will tease us. Because I'm like, if, yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll. <laughs> that's for another. It's for another. It's so probably it's for tease. David and Fab. Time, Apparently, you know, you'd maybe. have to turn into another one. Listen, I, yeah. I want to make sure that we get to your return here. You mentioned you launched here from Reading, but you return, and I have to ask because New Zealand's a pretty stunning place. I have to know what called you back. Mm, yeah, brokenness, like physical brokenness in mm. this case, and also. Just a, just a swirl of things. So there's this little strand in the background. It's amazing how all things really do work together for good. When I started my PhD in New Zealand, I felt so far away. I mean, so far away from New York City, so far away from all my family, so married, which was so far away from singleness. It, everything was new and far mm. and isolated and surrounded by water. And part of with, with that came a great freedom. And so mm. I woke up to or maybe I resurrected or it was resurrected in me that the desire to act again as well Ugh. and so I walked about two and a half hours to a casting agent's address to meet with someone with no the stakes were incredibly low for me because I was like well I'm already doing my PhD that's my bread and butter like that's that's where all my brain space is but they said we were allowed yeah. to do part-time jobs if we wanted and so I showed up at a casting agent's house Gave myself about 20 minutes outside because I was sweating because Wellington is a very hilly place. It's like San Francisco in that sense. And um, met with her, gave her my headshots, and she said, yeah, we'll work with you. And so I got to do extra work and stand-in work on the side while I was doing my PhD for the first couple of years until we moved to the South Island. And that's now we'll pause that. I finished my PhD. My husband and I are living in Kaikota, beautiful place. We have a 7.8 earthquake, which cuts us off from the rest of the world for a year, a month, and a day. And then really life is is planted in New Zealand now. We, we've been there for almost six years, finished my yep. PhD. Oh, wow. I'm managing communications for um, a large contract in Blenheim, which is the top of the South Island, and feeling at home and sort of not operating in my creative capacity fully. Mm. Um, but even with full-time work, I'm finding myself at a gallery all the time, painting and writing poetry and no longer working with an agent. So that part's not there, but, um, I, I got a concussion taking out my recycling. I hit my head and it incapacitated me to the point where I could work less and less and less and less. And then COVID happened and my husband was in Northern California and I was in New Zealand. He had taken a short-term job. So he came to New Zealand with special permission from the New Zealand government to join his wife who was injured. And it was 
within 24 hours, this dream job that I had, um, the contract was ended because of medical incapacity for me, which to be honest was a real relief because I had been, hold, you know, when you just hold, mm. you're just, I was bearing down and I was doing the work, but it was killing me. I, I, w I had nothing apart from mm. doing the work and then sleeping. And so I lost that job and I remember getting the phone call while I was sitting outside barefoot in the grass and I remember just laughing and weeping and thanking God because I was like, I just don't know how much longer I could have lasted. If they had kept me, I would have kept working, but it wasn't working well. Um, and my husband's boss called him and said, hey, there's, there's more work for you. We'd love to have you back in Northern California. And I didn't, I didn't want to come, but I didn't have much at all. My husband, we were both like, but we're New Zealand's home now. We've, right. you know, you're, you're mapping out where things are and how they'll work. And we went for a drive or along the bay. I remember the boats. I remember seeing the boats and yeah. And having a really clear, it's time to go. And so, um, we packed up and gave away a lot of things and came back to the States um, almost seven years later with the same number of suitcases we'd left America with when we first got married. So I got to ask, you went on this tremendous journey and we had the good fortune of, you know, us connecting and you coming to, to BCA and, <laughs> and now you're, you know, you're soon to become the, the head of drama here as Fab transitions into his new role and you've been with us now for what, a year and a bit? Yeah, a year and a half now, yeah. In our remaining moments, kind of flashing forward, having had this tremendous journey from creativity from such a young age to to now, what has God revealed to you? And I know he reveals a lot, and he's constantly speaking, but what is maybe the most impactful thing that he's done or said for you in the last year, year and a half, while you've been with us at PCA? Mm. I think actually um, it was something both of you said. It was one of my one of my first all school gatherings, and I was sort of a fly on the wall, right? I was an adjunct instructor, so mm. I came to as many things as I could because I was so fascinated that there was a community of artists who who lived and created and trained excellently while also being really committed to emotional, ment mental, physical, spiritual health. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming in, I think it may have been a worship night that was being had. And David, you were there with your wife and your kids were there. And Fab, you and Claire were there. And um, you said, welcome home. Mm -hmm. You said, welcome home. And it was home to the wanderers and mm -hmm. home to people who didn't have a place to be. And I was really struck by creativity in family, by mm. the idea that mm. um, that excellence could look very healthy and sustainable, that it could be driven by by a, a network of brothers and sisters and mothers and fathers who would hold each other up, but also who would um, support and challenge each other to become who each of us were designed to be. And that that really impacted me deeply. Um, yeah. It was, it was so funny because it's, it's so cool because, you know, we went looking for... And it, I'll just let you know, in Northern California, running a conservatory, it's not always easy to find amazing faculty. <laughs> it's really hard. <laughs> so I'm like there trying to find somebody. A ding comes up on my workable. All of a sudden I say, Dr. Amy Lee Wicks. I'm like, <laughs> oh my goodness. I start reading through her resume and I called you literally back, I think, <laughs> within 15 minutes of getting your resume. She had I was just like, literally just <laughs> hit send, It was like bro, and ink I think of, you were it was hot of the press. I think it was. It was that quick. And then the next day you were coming in, I was like, when can you start? I, I want to go back to something that Amy, uh, I think, <laughs> mentioned, because I'm curious about your thoughts, because, I mean, you and I talked about it, but it's so it's always so beautiful to get something echoed back that maybe we understood, maybe we had articulated. I'm not quite sure. It was more of a gut, Holy Spirit thing. But yeah. I've often 
seen like, uh, you know, I oversee the screenwriting program and I saw this last class. Um, all of them have been beautiful, but I, I got to see something really fascinating where I got to see a group of 10, 12 writers where typically in the industry, and you and I, we, we all, I'm sure, have felt this, where it's about it's about competition, it's about yeah. comparison. I mean, I know I was like a total anxious train wreck for four years of conservatory between the tender, insecure ages of 17 to 21. Yeah. I mean, I think I compared myself and competed for four years straight and almost killed me. Mm. And what I got to see is, I got to see a group of writers who instead of judging and tearing each other apart and trying to beat the other one outright the other one or whatever they just decided to really hold each other up yep. and here's the most fascinating thing not only was it a, a kinder um, friendlier environment sure you're gonna get that that's easy fruit to get but here's the fascinating thing i actually got to see how it multiplied exponentially everybody's ability to be in that kind of ecosystem oh, yeah. which seems self-evident yep. Yep. But when you behold it, when you see it, how have you seen that idea of community play out, man, with the actors, with with our other programs, the dancers? What what have you seen on that? I think that the moment you compare, comp like this health competition, right? So there's, a, there's a level yeah. of like healthy competition, not to compare, but it's like, let's all raise everybody up. Right. Let's call everybody to a higher standard. I think when there's comparison, it's the stealer of identity. I think when everybody mm. is in unison with one goal, which is to become excellent in their craft and know who they fully are in Christ, now that's contagious. Now that collective group of people creates an, an amazing culture that you're like, I am. I just can't go back to where I was. And I think that's currently where we're at right now in the conservatory. It feels like so like that. That's it. That's a, that's a good word right there, man. You know, that comparison is the thief of identity, identity of course, yeah. because the moment you start yeah. to compare yourself, you've forgotten who you oh, are. Oh, you've forgotten who you are. And you take eyes off who you are. So you take the focus of you and you put it on somebody else. The moment the focus of somebody else, comparison sets in and you start to look at what they have and what you don't have. So you function from that point of an orphan spirit, right? I remember I was in, uh, I was in LA and I was uh, between seasons of a show that I was on. And um, my family had traveled with me to Brooklyn and we'd, we'd shot this TV show and whatever. And, but I was auditioning when I was back uh, yeah. on hiatus from the show. And I remember that I was in the lobby and, you know, always with auditions, it's like you're staring at your doppelganger. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's always a version. Anybody of can play that role. Yeah, exactly, yeah, no, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So the guy and I are chit-chatting and, and because I've got a gig, I'm, I'm feeling a little extra, yeah. you know, just confident and okay. Like, eh, you know, I, I could... This job would be I'm on sweet, TV. but I'm just, yeah, I'm all right. <laughs> so I'm being maybe extra cocky. Yeah. And, but I remember being in there, and it turns out that my wife was pregnant with my third-born son, uh, now Isaiah, who's uh, 15 going on 16. And It turns out that she was. You mean by surprise? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> just happened to be. Lo and behold, I came back from uh, New York. No, no, not at all. So <laughs> she, my wife is pregnant, and we're looking to return uh, actually, I had booked the gig and we were getting ready to go to Brooklyn. We needed to find a, a, a midwife. So I'm chit-chatting with this actor and he mentions that his, that his sister is, is a midwife. And here he is just freely like, oh, hey, well, here's my sister's number. And like, we were literally traveling in weeks. Like my son was, we were going to arrive in New York like four or five weeks before he was born. So we needed a midwife or we were going to end up in a hospital, which my wife didn't necessarily wanted to do. So he gives me his sister's information and he's just being super kind and generous. And I, and, and I was kind of freshly saved. I'm maybe two years into my walk with the Lord. And I hear the Lord say to me, this, this job's not yours. It's his. And I realized in that moment that this whole struggle when mm. you're aching for a job, it's like, actually, it's probably already been or it's ordained. Been right? ordained. <laughs> yeah. It's actually just his. And the reason I brought you here was just to have this conversation. Now, we didn't necessarily yeah. you know, use her as, as the midwife, but I just remember hearing the Lord on that comparison point. All right. So I got to yeah. ask you, this is one of these questions as we begin to wrap. If you could talk to that little girl. The one who was playing kickball, who was writing and acting and producing and doing all the things that you were, well, if you were, she was sitting next to you, what would you say to her? What would you want to say to her? Well. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
I would tell her it's going to be fun. Mm. I'd tell her not to stop dreaming. Yeah. And I would, I don't know, I would tell her bigger, more. Yeah. Bigger, more. <laughs> don't ever get small. Yep. Don't ever get small. Yep. Don't ever be afraid to be big. And if there were, real quick, uh, with my two favorite questions, and if there were a young artist out there who's thinking about taking a creative leap of faith, what would you want to say to them? If not you, who? And if not oh. now, when? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Why that Why that hit you, man? Because what I say, it's like, you know, that there is a void out there. You know, we talk about the creative arts and, you know, God's primary mode of communication is creativity and you know, I think we, we dampen our creativity down so much that, you know, we want to influence the world for to, sh to show the world his face, right? Mm -hmm. Because we're in a world full of orphans. If we don't fill that void, somebody will. And the thing is, a lot of Christians are so scared of their creativity. And I'm on the road all the time seeing this. Mm -hmm. And it's our job to release them into the creative calling that God has, God has given and bestowed on them for them to steward and use. You know, that's why I'm like, you know, from my point of view now, I'm like, go for it. The worst that can happen is you'll fail. Like you went and did philosophy at, uh, uh, at King's. The, you're going to be a great human being. I'm like, the worst you can do is come and do a BA with us or any of our programs and be a better storyteller and a human. You know, it's never, never wasted. The first thing is, is explore it. Do it. Don't be afraid. You know, I, I, I just had this thought, you know, worse than failure is regret. Oh, yeah. Looking back on your life. Dang it. And you think, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Um, you know, it also reminds me of that this is what the Lord asks every prophet. Who will I send? Yeah. Who will go? It reminds me of Isaiah saying, I'll go. Yeah. I'll go. You want to close this out, ma'am? Yeah. Can, it, can we still buy this? Can you Absolutely. buy this? Absolutely. Brilliant. So where can we find it? Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Check it out online, probably the easiest way, through Auckland University Press. So check out The Dangerous Country of Love and Marriage by Amy Lee Wicks on Amazon. I'm excited. I'm going to get myself a copy of this and do some slum poetry with you, Doc. Perfect. Um, listen, it's, 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 it's such a great honor to work with you and hear your story and have fun and what you impart to just to us and all of our students is amazing. So I just want to thank you for being on Storia with us and we're so excited that you're on our lives. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching Storia. We will see you in our next episode.